Hello and welcome to episode number 293 of the Armin Show podcast with scientists, knowledge, creatives, and all kinds of variety. On this episode here, we have Professor Richard Koss. He has done research in many categories and has switched fields a few times. Interesting stories behind that. Welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. Glad to have you on. Now, I've looked at your, I like that you have a sketch of your path from one field of study to another to another and what took you to where you are. How would you describe how you got to where you currently are at UC Davis? Well, I was very interested in design. I have a degree in architecture and industrial design and I actually worked as an industrial designer, but I was working at the Douglas Aircraft Company and we were working on projects like interior of space stations and even lunar bases and thinking about even Mars habitats. And so I kept thinking about people are in these isolated environments, you know, they're not seeing much. And there, there was some research suggesting that um, what happens if you're in an environment where there's not much input, you tend to hallucinate, you may see faces in, uh, you know, dials uh, and uh, things start to melt and stuff like that. So there was serious research and serious concern that astronauts might suffer uh, visual problems. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to develop ideas where we could have patterns that would be very stimulating, very exciting visually. That could also apply to people in hospitalized settings, people recovering from cancer surgery, and so on like that. In other words, people that are really isolated. Uh, submarines as well. And so uh, I began to think about that and began to look at the literature, but not the design literature. I started looking at the research in animal behavior. Uh, I looked at stuff uh, uh, like Joseph Campbell's work on Mass of God that dealt with anthropological ideas about everything from prehistoric uh, art to uh, African mass and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, I came across Nico Tinbergen's book uh, on the dealt with the study of instinct. And uh, he talked about the idea that animals uh, may have uh, sort of the ability to recognize things, but he didn't use the word recognition. They react instinctively to shapes or maybe sounds. And these, uh, he called these sort of releasers or sign stimuli. And the idea was that they would automatically trigger an innate series of patterns of behavior. So you get motivated up and all of a sudden uh, you want to do things like a cat will start running around the room and try to chase something as if it's chasing a mouse. It doesn't see a mouse, but it's just like an uh, overactivity. And, but there may be something that triggers it like a little laser or a light on the floor will cause a cat to go crazy uh, because they have these patterns of wanting to chase something that's moving near them. They can't stop it. So that's the sort of idea. Well, I began to think is it possible that humans had a, a similar sort of response? But that was quiet. Uh, I was actually in a party, and uh, I, you know, this was in the background of my thinking, and people were dancing, and all of a sudden I had an experience that what I would say was almost like a religious uh, feeling where uh, all of a sudden my vision narrowed and uh, my heart started racing. And all of a sudden I saw what looked like a hawk coming towards you with, uh, with his claws out like that. And then the next view was from the view of the hawk and it looked like a lemur or some sort of primate retreating into a hole of a tree. And so I had these images and it was almost, I could say metaphorically, you remember the part of the first Star Wars film where they go to the speed of light and you see the, all of a sudden this explosion of stars. It was like that, but it was images of things I needed to do. And here I'm at, I'm working as an engineer at Douglas Aircraft Company. And I thought, you know, uh, I've, got to, I've got to pursue this. And so I went on and, and to UCLA and got my master's uh, thesis. And I studied this looking at eye patterns uh, and sharp edges and stuff, things that might be related to predator features to see if those could really influence design. And so there are lots of examples of that that I've, I've published. Um, so, um, that was really the, uh, the primary thing, and that was just such an, uh, an enriching experience that I just all the other interests in stuff like in aerospace uh, uh, engineering stuff all disappeared. It was all focused on could we find patterns that uh, people are responding to that might be useful in that way. And so that was kind of the beginning of that sort of uh, thinking. One interesting switch is after UCLA, you went to 
University of Reading in England and studied psychology. How did that switch happen? Well, I mean, I was working in Paris and I had an opportunity uh, to, because I was publishing stuff on uh, the idea of eye patterns and a woman, uh, Corin Hutt, uh, who studies autistic children was very interested because autistic children tend to have very little eye contact. And so as soon as they glance at you, they look away or they'll take a person by the arm and lead them to a door without looking them in the face. And these were severely autistic children. Now it was a rare disorder at that time. Now it's something like 150%. Uh, so I don't know what's going on in that context, but autism was not common. But because I was studying these eye patterns, she wanted me to go ahead and do a doctorate there. And so I did. I went ahead and switched from my design background into a PhD program and uh, was able to get through in three years. And it's all, it's mostly research oriented. So there wasn't any lot of coursework to take, but I was working in Paris at the time and I would travel back and forth. So I studied lemurs, which happened to be not too far from Paris in a city called Brunois. And then uh, there were uh, there were fish that were also in an aquarium. And I began to study those. And then I studied ch these children in England and that became my dissertation. So it was a it involved three species of study. Mm -hmm. and a lot of fun. Speaking of your dissertation before that, your master's thesis, I like this one because it was specific to predators and their sense of predator um, prey and their sense of predator features and noticing them, their two facing eyes and sharp teeth and claws. And then later you had your shiny objects theory that came from that. Do we still use this today? And what are shiny objects to the average person? Well, uh, one of the things that I was focusing on was I, I really had to start thinking about uh, studying species where I could actually do things you couldn't do with humans. For example, you can place animals in deprivation. Uh, if you're going to be doing neurobiology, you have to, you know, they have to sacrifice the animals and study their brains. And so I looked at other species that would provide insight that might relate to humans. Well, that particular part uh, came out because, because I'd had this aerospace background, uh, I had a fellowship from uh, NASA uh, in NASA Ames, which is in the Bay Area. And uh, I had an opportunity to work on the International Space Station. And I began to think about this idea because I was studying these shapes and I thought, you know, this is a, an enclosed area, but it's very shiny because of all the metal inside. And so I thought, well, maybe uh, there's a possibility that the shininess uh, has some sort of ecological properties to it. And began to think about it because as a designer, you know, you look at product designs, you have various surface finishes, these, these glossy paints, uh, sparkly surfaces. Uh, of course, we have jewelry, we have lots of things. So just look at the things around you that are glossy. And I thought, you know, there may be a natural attraction. So because I had a, a, an interest in anthropology, and uh, I, I studied again uh, a little bit of histories of, of hominid evolution. Uh, we realized that there were changes in, you know, over five million years ago in climate that might have affected the need to be very aware of where water was located. We know baboons, for example, are very careful in where they, they monitor the location of water. So they have to have water every day. And we as a species, too, uh, probably after about almost three million years ago, began to need water very routinely because the rainforest was diminishing. So that meant that we had to look for cues for water. So it could be, for example, you'd have grasses and you'd have a sparkle behind the grasses and that would tell you there was water there. Or you could have even moonlight hitting the water and you'd have reflections, uh, ripples in water. You could also have leaves that have water from moisture from rain and they would be glistening. So I thought there's all these different cues for water so let's study it in humans by giving them panels to look like that they can hold up and, and move in various light and rate them in terms of how glossy they were. But we also use sandy surfaces uh, and we use sparkling surfaces. We take this sort of glitter and spray it on a, on a, on a cardboard uh, container or a cardboard uh, uh, card. And then they can hold it and look at the sparkle as they moved it around visually. And so they rated these things on various aesthetic attributes in terms of being sensuous as well as being wet or very dry. And so we found that the glossy and sparkling surfaces, even though you get sparkling surfaces in concrete and other kind of rocks, connotes wetness. So it looks like that. And uh, then I had a colleague who was working with young infants and she was studying uh, their, their behavior, their, their mimicking, uh, uh, and using sign language 
But she also talked about the fact they had to clean their toys on the floor because they were getting saliva on them. And uh, the mirrors were being licked by the children. I thought, well, maybe I should study this at the level of uh, infants. And we did that. So we put plates out that were either metal plates or plastic plates. They were either glossy or dull and watched the infant's behavior. And it was very much like we were picking up kind of a precocious sort of water hole drinking behavior where even in developing countries, people will put their face into the water and they start to suck it up. And you see this in baboons, you see this in chimpanzees and even in children in, in developing countries. And that's why young infants can, or not infants, but toddlers can drown because they'll go to a pond of water and actually uh, suck it in. And one of my, my graduate students had a cousin uh, who died uh, drinking out of a very shallow pool of water in India. So uh, he, uh, he drowned. So the point is that this bathtub drownings and all these things occur um, routinely uh, because children want to put their face in water. Well, anyway, uh, that tells you as early as seven months that there's a likelihood that this is an innate system or it's a system where there's a lot of innate components in the way the brain is responding to water. So once I publish that, then you have uh, David Levant's book in 2009, Shiny Office Marketing. And that one actually lays out the rationale for his book, but he talks about this innate attraction and he cites my research in detail as sort of a fundamental background for his book. So that shiny object marketing, of course, eventually led to the ideas of having this vernacular part of our speech as a person who's attracted to something that's a shiny object, which is now used ubiquitously. And that is inspired, I think, by his book, which soon was inspired by my research. But if you think of the economy and you think of how we're attracted to glossy materials, gold, silver, uh, platinum, uh, diamonds, I mean, all these things have these qualities that look like they're wet. So it's a major component of our economy. Right. I was just thinking about that. It makes me wonder how much of what we think is good looking or cool or the current moment is just us connecting back to a thousand years ago or whenever it was knocked into us evolutionarily that this reminds us of water which would keep us more healthy? Well, you survived because you had to have water every day. It was really very essential, otherwise you'd dehydrate. And if you didn't find water, that's probably where natural selection would take out people who just failed to find water. Mm -hmm. But you see birds, for example, are very attracted to water. We have a, a, a pond in our backyard with a, a cascade of water that comes down. As soon as I turn around, the birds start coming and start drinking from it. They see the glistening of the water and there are cases of geese, you know, landing on fresh concrete uh, or, or, or uh, asphalt because it looks glossy because it's very shiny. So there are a lot of uh, different species that seem to be attracted to these uh, shiny surfaces. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind is how does it completely take up the person's thoughts whenever these items show up? Does all other attention fade away and it's a complete focus? Is that built into us? Well, I think it's mostly that these things are probably in the background. A lot of the part of the brain that is responding to faces and probably other textures is not necessarily the cortex. It's also subcortical. And we know that you can even be, uh, have damage to the back of your brain, the visual cortex, and still be able to see some shapes and move around. You don't recognize them verbally. You can't talk about them, but you, they're there. And so it's sort of a preconscious part of our our brain, but that uh, that's the same thing we see in lizards and fish, and I studied the, that in fish as well, the ability of these things to respond to faces. So that, that area is called, called the superior colliculus. So that's, it's like we have two brains, a, a more advanced version of the cortex, and then we have the subcortical part, the, the superior colliculus, which is very sensitive to visual shapes as well. So a lot of interest in that area now in research. Is that the section, does that include the fusiform gyrus or that's not connected to that? The well, fusiform gyrus is, yeah, that's associated with, with pattern recognition and that's the temple of right here by your, by sort of behind your skull where your ears are. Although this is actually centered deep in the brain, it gets input directly from the, uh, the retina. But it also uh, can go directly to areas that uh, trigger re flight responses so that you don't even have to feel emotions uh, to react. And so. I remember um, an experience in my office. I have a I had a large python 
skin that was uh, coiled up and it was in a bag and it somehow dropped out of uh, an area on a shelf into a floor and it was raining. I reached to get uh, the, this bag for, for protecting my uh, uh, teaching materials and I saw the head of the snake, which was about, I would say this big, and I blasted across the room instantly and then I said, oh, there you are. I mean, in other words, my thoughts about this response occurred after, and my emotions were following that effect. So in other words, I reacted the natural case when you see a snake just to freeze or jump out of the way. And then you react, you start to think about what is it I'm doing or what happened. And I found this happening, for example, in Australia when you're walking along a trail and you might see some roots, all of a sudden you'll freeze. And so in several cases this happened, and there are very venomous snakes in Australia. This is in the tablelands. And I would stop and I'd say, what is it? And I would take my camera and drop it down like that so I could see what it was. And there, I photographed these roots. They were just in the, in the you know, we saw very few snakes in that particular research uh, uh, part of my life. But anyway, so those are the things that are very natural. Now that's very close to being like what Tinbergen thought of, of what they call innate releasing mechanism. But I'd like to think of these things more as really another form of recognition system that's very old. And uh, it responds to snake scales, uh, it responds to facial expressions, responds to two eyes. So it's a, it's a very basic part of the brain. Uh, the one thing, the two eyes, so was that, how was that checked? Was that compared with like, is there any one-eyed organisms or if there was like no eyes on the face? Was there a comparison? Well, in the, I, I'm not sure I, I got your question. I think the, the big thing is that probably our sensitivity to two eyes is because if something is looking at you, even peripherally, you need to know it indicates that there's a tension directed at you. There's something you don't know what it is, or why it's looking at you. It could be another animal, but you have a sense of it's like in theory of mind, it, it, it's interested in you for some reason. And that's the uncertainty there. And, and in some cases, if an animal would be a predator lurking behind grass, all you might see are its forward eyes poking through. So that's why the pattern by itself is effective, even without the rest of the face. And uh, one thing this makes me think of is I used to often would talk to people in public and sometimes I would uh, look at strangers and some strangers it would almost become like a staring contest and you could almost feel for certain individuals like their aggression was starting to go up very quickly unless something happened. Is there any connections with that with animals about how like they look at each other and one has to give up at some point? Well, that's that. There's a, a, a process called gaze aversion. That's like we have with autistic children. That's probably also subcortical, initially, where you you look at something, uh, you look at a person, you have eye contact, and you look away, in part because it's arousing. Looking away, you're looking at something else, so you're not getting that arousal. But you're also signaling at the same time you're not interested. But often you find that a person who's talking uh, will tend to focus attention. And the other person is looking away uh, because it's difficult to maintain eye contact for very long. Uh, so you can have two people face to face and have them stare at each other, and all of a sudden you'll see they're very uncomfortable doing that. <laughs> uh, but uh, probably the most, one of the more fearful experiences I had was in Africa in the back of a Toyota pickup truck. This was on a game drive, so we are, we're up uh, off the ground looking at lions, and I had a video camera. And I filmed the, the in right into the eyes of this lion that was looking at me. And all of a sudden, and I had a colleague next to me who had binoculars. Simultaneously, we felt like our stomach was moving up into our throat. It was like this thing coming at you. Just the eyes were bigger and bigger of the lion. That was by far the most uh, striking experience I've had. And I have the recording of the video. And, it, and when you look at it, in retrospect, it's not so bad. But then I'm sitting in a chair. I'm not there physically exposed to the lion. So it doesn't look the same as if you're actually really there. Now being on foot with lions in the background, which I've been, is an interesting experience. It's quite different than being in a vehicle. Right, suddenly it's you and them and there's no protection. Right, there's a complete difference with in-person versus, I think about that sometimes with like people who are reaching out to people for dating versus online, there's a completely different world because one is way more your feeling and then online it's like pictures and text and right there's no nervousness whatnot to it one thing that connects back to that you had mentioned fish research one of your articles is in the top journal 
on the planet called science and talked about fish brains and how the dendritic spines on their neurons were impacted by extended social experience. How did you check that? Well, it, it's interesting uh, because I was studying two facing eyes and fish, they start to recognize faces when they're as little as, as one uh, centimeter long, which is a tiny little thing. So the brain is very tiny. This is again the optic tectum. And so I reared them in deprivation to see, to make sure this was innate. I would wear a mask that didn't have any patterns. There were no uh, circular patterns on the walls of these uh, uh, a little terraria. Uh, so the animals were swimming around. I never saw anything that were really shapes of eyes. The fish that swam in front of them were eyeless. I used blind cave fish, so I never saw eyes from them. And then I looked at them at an older age and they were behaving rather strangely. I exposed them to their own species for the first time and they turned bright red. Never seen the colors like that. Uh, they were very, uh, it was erratic, these are older fish. And so I said, we need to study the brains. And so uh, I went into, uh, we sectioned uh, the optic uh, tectum or the, the and found a, a, a neuron that looked very much like a Christmas tree. And it had branches that spread out very much like a tree. And uh, so we began to quantify whether there were differences in the number of branches on those neurons. And, uh, uh, and also, we also saw what looked like little, uh, if you look at neurons uh, and use a mic uh, microscope and get very close to them, uh, you can see what looked like little mushrooms around the dendrite itself. These are called dendritic spines. They have the mushroom head and then they have a stem like this. And uh, so also, as we were looking at that, and I did very careful drawings of these things. Uh, I had a colleague challenge me about this, and I looked at the literature, and this fellow was talking about the idea these stems may actually operate as providing resistance, so they stop the flow of information into the neuron. I looked at my drawings, I said, my gosh, the heads are bigger on my drawings than they are on the ones that were isolated. So the animals that were reared normally, the fish uh, had these round spines, the others were tiny, things narrow like that. And so uh, that led to uh, studying that uh, you know, in a formal sense and publishing it in science. And so that was a cover article. And that actually got quite a bit of inspiration in, in the field. So I was very pleased with that. But we also went ahead and looked at Honeybees too, and they have a different shape neuron. It looks a lot like a hippocampus. Uh, and uh, that particular uh, part of the brain uh, uh, is involved with processing where they're flying, and, and it also can be useful for recognizing flavors and, and so on, nectar. And we looked at honeybees just as they came out of the, uh, the nest or out of the, the comb, and then we looked at them when they were just beginning to fly, and then also when they had, were older, and notice that the neurons were filling up with these spines that were nice and round like that versus the ones that were tiny or, or narrower and the smaller, you might say mushroom head, uh, when they were very young. And so we flew them for the first time. And that first flight, which only was a few minutes long, caused changes in these longer spines. They swelled like that. Uh, we also did uh, work on chasing fish to act, make it look like they were being chased by a predator and it caused the same thing, and particularly the longer spines. So that indicated that the, uh, these spines are very flexible. And there's some uh, computer modeling suggesting that the, 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 the stem of the spine has high resistance and that when you make the head larger, it makes the stem shorter and that might affect the conductance or the way the, the information passes from the synapse to the, to, the, to the dendrite. So it could be an important component underlying uh, enhancing the synapses, possibly learning. So it's, uh, it's an interesting area, but you know, it was so intense, this doing microscopy. I would be doing, I also did it with mammals as well. I, I was starting to hallucinate. I'd be on my bicycle and there'd be a neuron in the road. And it would flash at me, or it's like when people are doing, when they're, when they're uh, doing a lot of gardening and they're trying to pick up weeds, you'll find yourself having mental flashes of weeds in your head. And that was the same effect I had. <laughs> I thought, this isn't good for me. I better not continue to do this. And I had other interests as well, so I didn't stay exactly with that. Uh, you know, I, that was enough. I did, we did some computer modeling, wrote, wrote a big paper in 1985, and I thought, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Two things come to mind there. One, a person who knows when enough is enough will always have enough. And then the concept of when you're thinking about something, it just shows up everywhere in a dream or you see it in public or you recognize it more. Oh, is that connected to the 
particular activation system and our focus? Do you look at that at all? Well, they, the area that's uh, that's uh, like the what they call a midbrain per aqueductal gray or what they tag PAG is an area that crosses these flight responses or freezing or jumping back. So we did look, we did look at ground squirrels uh, interacting with a snake, and uh, the thought was uh, we looked at the uh, the way neurons were acting in cell staining to see if this, because they, they produce a protein. And it turned out that the structures like the amygdala were not uh, really heavily involved. It was looking like they were, mostly it was this uh, area of the of this brainstem area that was really activated because they got very excited and saw a snake. But I haven't published that because uh, it, we, first of all, it requires killing the animals. And the other aspect was, is uh, we were gonna do this in the wild. Uh, it would mean shooting the animals and that it just, there were some ethical aspects. And I thought, no, I don't think I wanna see that. We wanted to do it in real life where you could see the real event occurring in nature and then look at the brains. So um, that was towards more of the end of my career, getting towards retirement. And so I thought, you know, it's, uh, it's better. We'll, we'll play with it in some cases. Maybe there's some other people that would follow up on it in the laboratory work, but you still have to look at the brains uh, uh, by sectioning them and, and using microscopes to, to uh, identify neurons. It's good to always so it's a, that's, But that tells you about the idea that the, uh, the brain stem is very important. We also published a paper on alarm calls and uh, the white, white faced capuchins recognize snakes. They do it at a very early age. It's another area of an innate system. And uh, they produce a very short alarm call, which is almost like a whistle. And it's, it seems to alert adults around them. That's one of the things we'd studied earlier. And the most recent publication uh, showed that the, they're these, particularly the young, when they see a snake that looks like it'd be dangerous, like a boa constrictor versus a snake that doesn't have any patterns on it. Uh, then they, they react with these alarm calls. And it, and it looks like the way that this area is structured, this uh, superior colliculus feeds directly into the, uh, the midbrain periaqueductal gray. So there's no bypassing up into the arousal system. It just goes right there. And that may account for why they're not having noisy alarm calls. Because the, when, it, when you're aroused, often you have this guttural sound in your voice. It's a, you know, the vocal folds are not uh, smooth and regular. And because you're excited, and so you're kind of hoarse, and you're, and that's why people when they shout have hoarse voices. So, uh, but it was a very, very tonal kind of uh, uh, call. So that's another example where maybe we know that in these uh, monkeys that they do have that connection to the brain in that area, directly from the superior colliculus to the uh, PAG. So again, it's like you can react very preconsciously without necessarily feeling emotions. At least in this species, it looks that way. Right. When you just said that about the sounds, it reminded me of Professor Blumstein talking about the nonlinearities that are in fear sounds in a recent episode. And since I am bringing out, how, how have you guys worked together in the past? Or what have you worked on? Or how do you know each other? Well, uh, he was one of our graduate students when I joined the uh, Animal Behavior Graduate, one of the first ones. And one of, probably one of the more dynamic uh, graduate students we've had. It's uh, had a wonderful career, very, very vigorous. He worked in Pakistan on marmots. <clears throat> and he's actually seen uh, arousal in, in a call, in alarm calls as well. Plus, he's also seen tonal qualities in alarm calls. So that's why he talks about the nonlinearities of the alarm call. But uh, the thing that we found in this other uh, paper with the uh, white bait capuchins is if a young infant is calling with an alarm call that is tonal, the callers that call the next caller often has a more tonal call. So it's like if I'm shouting or like whistling, the other one will whistle back with a kind of a similar kind of sort of pure, more pure tone than being a very noisy call. So there's a correlation between the communication of the monkeys themselves. And that was a very interesting part. That was unexpected, but that showed up. I've noticed that with all, almost all kinds of communication, there's some sort of rapport built in or else there wouldn't be the communication. There's adjustment to whatever the person that brought the communication brought. Uh, so you're on the same page in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a sort of like you're, you're sort of matching, uh, uh, but it also indicates that if I'm aroused and, and or I'm alarmed and maybe that call is recognized as indicating that I'm alarmed, then the, the, the person that hears it or the animal that hears the call also gets excited 
for the same reason. It's very, it's very protective in that sense. That's why you want to say fire you know, in a movie theater or something <laughs> like that. Uh, There's a fire in here. Yes, there is. We agree. Now people yeah. react, uh, and they, they this idea of this, uh, and that's that's another interesting phenomenon where people will mob or crowd because they get frightened and they all go in the same direction. For example, imagine <laughs> someone is running in this direction. You're going to run with them. You're not going to, if they're running in that direction, you're not going to start running in this direction. There's something bad over here. That's why they're running that way. And that's exactly what monkeys do too. They watch each other. The young ones watch each other first for a moment before taking off. The older ones just go when they hear the sound. So th these are, these are uh, bottom macaques in India where we studied. We would, we would present models of leopards uh, and uh, they would pop into view and then, uh, or they would play back alarm calls. And of course, the young ones would sometimes pause before fleeing while the adults were fleeing, and that would tell them not only the direction, but also it tells them how important that sound is as well. So they're learning some of the sounds. They even do this with alarm calls from other species. So you have a, a, a bottom of a cat calling, but then you may have a langur make an alarm call. Well, that's not their species. So they learned that that's also a possibility there's a leopard nearby because the, the langur has seen the leopard, the bottom macaques haven't seen the leopard, but that tells them the leopard's nearby. <clears throat> Very valuable. I like that distinction between the older ones making their own decision and then the younger ones following. And it says something about once you've grown up and you are more acting than reacting or following. Yeah, there is a lot more automatic behavior too. Uh, uh, young monkeys tend to be very responsive to honking horns of cars coming by in trucks and stuff like that. And as they get older, they're kind of, all these sounds that might be provocative, they're kind of winnowing out, saying that doesn't matter, it's, it doesn't, it's irrelevant now. And so they narrow it down to what isn't relevant. So it's by learning by deletion of the, of the, uh, of the sounds that don't mean anything to them. So it's a, it's just an interesting way you learn. You respond to lots of things in the beginning, and then you kind of take them out or winnow them down. I they have the consequences that are important, so why respond to them? Right. That's how they learn the alarm calls. We think of other species. So they're not just their own alarm call, but the alarm calls of others nearby. Oh yeah. It's something very, I like to always follow along. There's what we describe as a person's life and the things they do. And then underneath that is like the plasticity of the brain reducing over time. And then the neurons uh, cutting out the extra little bits and just having the main ones kind of like how the personality tends to grow over time into fixed these items and less change. It's like we're looking at the person, but underneath this is happening in the person. I kind of like the duality of knowing both at the same time. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing sort of thing. I, I like to think of the brain as very, very plastic, but one of the things that's most interesting, it re relates back to the study of infants. Drinking a plate as if you're putting your head on a plate, as if you're drinking it like water, is not something you would do, you know, this is a nursing age infant. Why in the world are they doing this behavior when in fact it's something that's more practical and you might say functional when you're like seven or eight years old when they drink up because you know they're nursing maybe up to four years of age in some of these uh, uh you know uh, hunter gatherer groups so historically it would not be functional but one of the things i've seen is that we do see young animals behaving inappropriately as if uh, it's adult like the uh, young pups will for example respond to snakes when they're way too young to defend themselves they have immunity to venom, but they don't have immunity that's that body size. Uh, you have, for example, Thompson and gazelles jumping up and they're starting where they, uh, when they, when maybe there's a rustling nearby or they think there's a, maybe a, a wild dog or a hyena, they might jump in the air or possibly a leopard, which is very endangering to them. But as an adult, it might say, look, I see you and look at me, I have good muscles, so I'm able, I'm able to get away, so don't bother me, I'm, I'm capable. I'm not limping or injured. And so that indicates that the, as the brain is developing, and this is one of the areas that I really think is important, you have these early circuits installed because the genes are expressing themselves shortly after birth or before birth. And so you're putting down circuits that are useful later in life when you're younger. And one of the things about water that's very interesting is, and again, I can't tell you anything empirically, it's just through observation, 
discussions of other, but when you have Alzheimer's disease and late Alzheimer's, you often find uh, uh, these Alzheimer's patients licking the surfaces of shiny tables or maybe the railings. All of a sudden, it's like this infant-like thing comes back because neurons are retreating. Well, that means these things are installed early in the brain and now they're becoming expressed again, you see. So uh, I think a lot of this precocious behavior is, uh, is important. The other thing I think about precocious behavior is it might be able to uh, allow you to look at ancestral behavior because these, the genes of you know, natural selection shape this to be very reliable. So you build it on, it's like a, a tree forming where the young branches are, are there, then they grow, but the peripheral branches might come off or break off. And neurons are much the same way. So as long as you build it on the core of the tree, uh, or the dendritic tree in this case, it's going to be stable throughout your life. It's available for use throughout life. And so I think that's the, the value of uh, that kind of installation in the brain. This is a nice feature. This is kind of like the, you know, <clears throat> your brain doesn't develop much, so much past uh, 25, let's say. And then early on, you have these things set in stone for responding to your environment. And when you're 40 or 80 or 60, the base items you had programmed in at 10 or 7, they are your, that's your strengths in a way. Well, a lot of your memories are better in childhood at certain ages than they are later on as an adult because, again, they're stabilized very early on that part of the brain. But the thing that's interesting is that also uh, what's intrigued me is that when we take a species that is uh, migrated in areas with no predators, uh, you can still get them to respond to predators that haven't been around for a long time, which means that this information about what a predator is and maybe where it, where it lives uh, can be retained in the brain as information. It's not functional anymore if you're not living in an environment with the predators, but if you place them in a setting where you can recreate the, the past, like we did with ground squirrels, we put them in a lab, we expose them to snakes. These squirrels have not been exposed to snakes for almost a third of a million years, and they still respond very much like that of those that currently expose the snakes. So this tells you that humans can retain information very likely too in the same way. And so I've studied that a little bit with children and that's been uh, one of my fun projects is looking at the, what kind of residue do we have historically that can show up in young children like the, the water perception thing is an example. You had brought about another example with the children which was anti-predator refuge in trees how do we view trees when we see them and what does that mean to us innately? Yeah, we talk about people having tree hugging. Uh, I've been very intrigued about whether uh, males and females differ on attraction to the trees, but mainly at the level of children. <clears throat> and we find that if you look at the playground environments, girls will be climbing on playground structures more than boys. Uh, this goes up to about maybe seven or eight years of age. They're also injuryless. We've studied injury where they fall off and they have to go to the hospital, and so we have those records. And it turns out that they're injured less, so girls climb more than boys. They're injured less than boys when they do climb. And so uh, we've looked at rock climbing behavior. Some of this hasn't been published. We've, uh, I've also published stuff where, where you actually had children simulate climbing a tree with their fingers till they actually go where they feel safe. So we say, well, uh, here's an ex a, a story where there's a lion that's escaped from the zoo and was seen nearby. Where would you climb to feel safe? And we have these silhouettes of trees and these children will climb with their fingers and where they would go to feel safe. And the girls go out to the edge of more of the edge of the tree. The boys tend to go more in the center. But the point is that that behavior itself, there's no way they would know how to do that. But that's what these monkeys do. They go out to the thinner branches where a heavier body predator can't get them. So baboons do it, macaques do it, landers sleep at the edge of the tree. So they're trying to protect themselves at night in areas of the tree that the uh, python or the leopard that's heavier body can't get them. How would these children know that? This, well, this is over three million years old. That's how old this pattern of behavior would have to be. It's interesting. That means there may be other behaviors we have as well. Right. The boys were more towards the center of the tree, so like a little bit more risk taking? No, I think that they just, uh, I think the girls recognize that the shape of the tree, of what they call affords better safety, better refuge. Mm -hmm. And if you look historically where we have body size dimorphism historically, uh, if we go to Australopithecus, 
Uh, we find that males were uh, heavier than females, probably slept more on the ground. Females were nesting in trees. And so if you're going to be looking at that environment, you know that trees have certain kind of utility. If you can't climb as well, but we find, for example, that uh, uh, in chimpanzees, that the heavier body chimpanzees can't forage as well at the edge. If they do, they're in danger of themselves. In fact, in some cases, uh, if they're low status, they're kind of pushed out to the edge, which could actually cause them to fall. So there's an understanding that branches and the thickness of the branches uh, uh, may provide safety as refuge. And uh, that seems to be there, and uh, these girls seem to show that behavior, which was, uh, you know, we predicted that if there was a retention of that. But we'd also studied monkey, uh, we studied monkeys in their sleeping patterns too to, to see that behavior as well. So it wasn't confined to that, except that they're smaller bodies, so they don't differentiate between uh, males and females about where to go in the tree to sleep. But if you're a big, heavy male, you know, you're weighing, for example, you know, uh, let's say, for example, if I translate it to about 100 pounds versus, let's say, 50 pounds or less, there's a big difference in body weight, and that can make a difference in where you climb in a tree for foraging or anything. So girls are very sensitive to trees, it looks like. One thing that came to mind about the trees was, you know, they are complete uh, difference. If you have a flat plane and then trees make it look completely different to you, and it seems like you're going into a jungle or forest that gives you a certain feeling. What about uh, height and hills and uh, versus flatland? Is there any sort of predator prey perspective there, that changes? There's some, there's some work on women being a little bit more risk sensitive uh, in terms of uh, these, uh, these open environments. And so <clears throat> there is some degree of sex differences there as well, feeling more protected against the little wall behind you, looking out uh, from an enclosed area. So I think that there, there's more to it than just that. We also studied uh, young children, this was published more recently, where we had cameras on their head with helmets, they had bicycle helmets, and then we could video record their behavior. And we showed them a model leopard or a model uh, deer, uh, it would pop up behind a trunk, behind a tree, and then we would ask them to go where they felt safe. And the, the boys would go into areas that were more sheltered, where they were, could hide. And the girls went out more in the open. And that was it. They were treating the environment differently. The girls wanted to maintain contact with the, with the predator. Where was the predator located? The boys just wanted to get out of the area and, and find an enclosed area to hide. So there was a difference there that was a pretty, pretty dramatic. As far as the innate quality, are all these innate elements from hundreds of thousands of years ago, if you don't teach children anything, they are built in? All these things are... Well, I, I think you want to... I, I like to look... I like the, the perspective of thinking as learning as adjustment of instinct. So in other words, the instinct, the instinctive systems are probably laid down early in, in, in terms of... They may be less plastic, but there is plasticity there. The second thing is they may be, they may provide the architecture for learning as well. So many guides learning. So the learning is more specialized, but uh, so there's a, you might say there's a, uh, uh, a property where it becomes uh, more like a scaffold that kind of structures the way learning unfolds. So you can't really escape the innate system, which is very old, but it also is aiding the way things are being laid down later on. So there's more specialized learning. Uh, and animals, they can learn some things better than others that may relate to natural selection operating on that. Uh, so it's, it's important. <clears throat> if someone puts, is this why we like natural environments or forest, they kick these systems into gear once more? Can you increase your awareness through just being in nature and suddenly have more of a sense of, oh, there's prey and there's a deer and there's like, you start to really get a sense of organisms? Well, I, I think of uh, I think of these things uh, in a sense of very contextual. For example, we have some beautiful rolling hills uh, where we live as we go to the Bay Area from Davis, uh, and uh, and I would uh, ask my wife, I say, well, now imagine a pride of lions in those hills. Now, how do you think about the hills? See, it's, it depends upon what sort of is there in the environment you're sharing it with. But in cases that are pretty safe, uh, and it's for me, it's always exciting to think that there may be some dangerous animals in an environment because you have to be very vigilant. It makes it more uh, more enriching than just being totally safe. But the thing that's uh, that's intriguing about uh, 
the, this environmental aspect is uh, that in the most, and it's actually scary because one of the scariest lectures I gave uh, uh, in my class, I started off by saying, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures and this is why this is scary. I showed them examples of beautiful forest environments and then I showed them areas that were tundra where there were just the, there would be water in the foreground and maybe mountains with snow. And, and I'm saying now, guess what? Uh, where is your preferences? And of course, people really like the tundra and the uh, open areas that feel where you can see and, and feel safe. I said, now think of that in terms of uh, how you would feel about mowing down forests, uh, uh, planting uh, uh, houses there, or at least clearing the area. You wouldn't feel necessarily any regard or any concern about that because it's naturally more comfortable to see an open area. I said, that's damaging to the environment because you have very low biodiversity in these rather arid environments. So these are areas that are cold. And I says, that's why it's scary because we may have a natural propensity to be safe, feel safe in open areas where we can see and we, can, we have clear views of things versus being in very enclosed with forest areas very nearby. And, you, and a lot of your view is occluded as you move through it. So that's an interesting aspect that, uh, uh, about our behavior that actually could be envir environmentally damaging. The fact we don't have inhibition to clearing, clearing forests. So it's, a, it's an interesting thought. Uh, <clears throat> keep in mind, if you look at the way lions uh, are looked at by uh, ungulates in, the, in, in, out in, let's say, the African savanna, they're very comfortable foraging near lions as long as they can see them. You know, as soon as it gets dark or it starts, they become very vigilant, very alert. Lions are still relaxed in the background. We photograph this uh, a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I think what happens is that there is, as, as your vision becomes limited, and it could be occlusion due to grasses, uh, areas that obstruct the views, you get more frightened <clears throat> because you can't see what, what's there. As long as you can see where, it's, where the danger is, you feel safe. Now imagine, for example, what they do in horror films. Let's take the movie Aliens. You're in an enclosed area. Take the first Alien series, the most scary one, where you have almost these, uh, uh, the canines of, the, of this uh, uh, alien look very much like that of hyenas. You don't know where it is. You know it's there, but you can't see it. And then that's where the scary part is. And you see, it, a lot of these movies have that. They don't show you the, uh, the dangerous thing immediately so you can habituate. They just let you know it's there. Uh, and uh, you're going to be aware that it possibly could get you, if, uh, but you don't know how necessary to behave because you don't know where it is. And we found this with monkeys too. We'd show them a leopard and uh, it would disappear from view and they'd go crazy. They don't know where it is. And they would search around because they needed to find where it was located. So this, uh, we capitalize on this all the time in these adventure films and horror films. Thank you the long ago history of us versus us and having to deal with animals in public, how would we fare with past humans of 300,000 years ago? Would they completely outdo us? Would they be way more relaxed in a predator filled environment than we would be? You know, there's a lot of uh, thinking now that we probably have been pretty good ambush predators ourselves, uh, going back at least a million years. And then in the middle of Stone Age, we developed these uh, uh, spears, which we could then throw, which gives us more range. But very likely, we were throwing rocks uh, at uh, lions and hyenas to move them off their kills, uh, going back maybe as early as 1.5 million years ago, because the shoulder shows signs that we have, it's rotated in such a way for throwing very fast. And that means throwing stones. And the only reason we would be throwing stones is either to maybe possibly to kill something if we could throw accurately, but to drive away these animals from these, uh, these sites so we could then steal their kills, we could scavenge. Well then, of course, that could lead to retaliation. So I think probably by the last uh, half million years, the lions uh, learned to be very cautious of humans uh, slowly. And then of course, when we developed poison arrows, uh, then it became very, uh, it could be lethal to engage humans. So uh, that's why lions, uh, when you're on foot, lions tend to back away. If you're in a group, they don't, you're more in danger if you're alone. But uh, when you're with other people, uh, they'll, they'll start to moan and, and growl and back away. <clears throat> it almost seems like a lot of their systems of the various animals are nearly exactly the same as our systems. And then we have some additional features. 
Well, they'll get you at night. See, that's where, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why nighttime is so spooky, you see, because it's the, that's the time. Because think of, think of leopards, for example, these, these uh, monkeys can recognize leopards by their spots and, and the color. So the leopard's caught in a dilemma. Now that there's a dark morph that probably can hunt more effectively because it don't, you don't see the spots, but it's conspicuous because of its dark, uh, dark shape. So the shape is important as well. But at nighttime, uh, you know, you can't see very well, so you find refuge. Uh, but the idea that these, uh, uh, you, you'll see these, the ability to, to, to discriminate an animal by its surface, its textures, makes it hard for an animal to hunt. So you find lions and leopards killing people at night. They don't do it so much anymore, but uh, you go back to uh, uh, probably a few centuries, and even in India, back in the early turn of the last century, uh, you had leopards going right into homes and pulling people out by their necks, uh, you know, and no one would know they're there. They quietly would drag the person out of the, uh, uh, the house. This is uh, in southern India. So uh, very scary. I mean, it's, uh, the things did, did go bump in the night at one time. That is true. That's like a quietest kidnapping ever and removal of some form. That's funny. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. One concept that came across when I was reading of your works was evolutionary aesthetics. How would you describe that concept? Well, I, I think that uh, what I talked about initially when I got very excited about the idea of, uh, of maybe that we study predator-prey interactions and how predators appear to humans might be the source of thinking about some aesthetics. That's probably the foundational paper that deals with that issue. And then, uh, but others have studied all sorts of things. They've studied the habitats, uh, they've studied the rolling hills and the beauty of, uh, of water and the mountains and snow and so on. And I would think any kind of environmental perception uh, would, would kind of deal with some aspects of evolutionary aesthetics. The other aspect, of course, is that people now are, are really jumping on snake perception and the aesthetics of snakes. That seems to be something that's very popular. And I studied it in monkeys, and I said, you know, and I kind of ran out of time to go back to humans. It was part of my, my, my series to do, but I got so intri in, intrigued by studying these in other species uh, that I didn't really follow up on my own uh, interest in evolutionary psychology, except for the water perception stuff and a few things. But one of my graduate students recently published a paper where he had people wearing, uh, they were uh, in, they were photographed of them in a large uh, airport uh, waiting area. And uh, uh, you can see that if you look at eye tracking to see where you look, if you're a, a human subject, you tend to look at people who are wearing textures that repeat themselves, including the, you know, leopard uh, spots on, or rosettes on, on dresses. So uh, there are things about the environment. I would say that that would fall into evolutionary, uh, doing evolutionary aesthetics in that sense. Uh, but it's just a component of evolutionary psychology, I think, now. It's, it's becoming kind of nested <clears throat> in that area, where you're thinking about an evolutionary paradigm, and then you may study different attributes of human responses, including the way of beauty and other attributes uh, of the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a real formal area of research. Mm -hmm. One thing I always like to look at is what makes us specific in a category and what would you say based on your multi disciplines is what slightly differentiates you when you're doing your research how do you include design and or architecture and or uh working with airplanes well i i think i i think that if you were trying to let, let's say for example uh the uh john Hudson's uh uh, this is in Sydney, you have this opera house. If you look at the opera house, it looks like little shells that are cut like that. But if you look at it on the horizon, it's very zigzaggy and it really stands out. Or the Air Force Academy building, uh, uh, it has these very sharp spikes and they just pop right out uh, visually. So in that sense, you would be looking at something that pulls your attention. Now, what does it mean? That's a different issue. I mean, the spires that are sharp, you know, may well signify, uh, a, a, you know, leading up to God. Uh, or some other aspect that's inspirational. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, uh, uh, any emotions associated with it exactly the same. So you can have things that look very religious oriented that are very provocative visually, 
uh, that would still capture this. And one of the things that I, I never studied, but I was very interested in Islamic architecture, where you see a lot of snake scale like patterns and the way the, uh, uh, the ceramics, uh, the tiles are laid down. Or you look at the, uh, at a, uh, uh, an Islamic rug, a prayer rug, and the patterns there might well imbue, for example, a feeling of emotions. You're looking at a, at a pattern that has kind of a quality that's very biological, but your emotions are spiritual within the context of that. So in other words, these things can have different meaning. There's a, a set of uh, uh, horn cores, which is uh, the horns of, uh, of, uh, <coughs> of cattle that were uh, in a very early phase of domestication in Anatolia, Turkey, in this one place called Chateau Huac. And these are very aggressive looking shapes like this uh, that were in these uh, sort of shrine rooms. And I kept thinking, uh, you know, imagine walking around with torchlight at night and you see the shadows on the walls of these things. It would be very creepy, but it could also be very spiritual in the sense of manifesting emotions that you then treat in a different context. It's not something threatening, but it's still arousing. So uh, in a way that could be viewed as positive rather than adversity. That's interesting. You have to really think about the nature of context in this case. Something that really dangerous can look, because some of our most beautiful shapes we see are dangerous. They could really hurt you if you fell on them. But they're gorgeous to look at. Right. Like a ninja so star. Why, why, well, part of it, and the same thing too, I think if it's important, I mean, that's partly maybe where I think beauty is relevant here, is that some of these biological forms that might be provocative are, are there so they remind you where they are. Uh, so you, but the, the point is that uh, they also will pull your attention. That's very relevant. Uh, but the the attraction to it, uh, again, could have different contexts. But the attraction itself, is based on the shape itself, uh, you know, is, is very substantive. It's very important, uh, very provocative. So, for, for example, tree may connote refuge for safety. A beautiful tree with a crown that spreads like that means you could go out and be very safe. So you like trees. Trees that are shaped like this provide shade, so mm -hmm. they have multiple functions. So you're attracted to something because of its utility or what it affords for your maybe protection. But there, the, the attraction is there. The beauty, I think, is there to kind of reinforce that. In other words, you're attracted. The beauty itself might signify that's important. Be aware of it. Remind yourself of it. So that's why, for example, one of my colleagues, Liz Isbell, talked about one of the most beautiful shapes she saw was a leopard crossing the road in front of her. I mean, it was, she says it was a gorgeous shape moving slowly across the road. Now, here's a dangerous animal. It wouldn't necessarily be dangerous to her in that context. But it was gorgeous, the motion of it. And so, uh, you know, we've seen uh, examples, this is just anecdotal, of where uh, our, our bottom macaques in India, uh, when, in one case, we saw a small cat that apparently had been caught in the corner by a series of uh, these monkeys and one of them was banning the pet the others pet them the cat the cat was very nervous about these monkeys around it it was like a tiny leopard it was safe but something was very important about that shape that cat was not neutral to those monkeys even though right. it, was, it was not dangerous you see so i think that we, had, we can think of beauty as having these various features of them some of them relate to things like attraction towards water others may be because it's important to know where it is or what it can do or what it affords for your protection and so uh, that's why i think and of course they provide navigational locations they provide indication of maybe the resource available uh, by gordon orians one of the early researchers on that he talked about certain trees might connote the availability of water because of the shape of the tree itself. So there are all sorts of different signals that might be out there that make the environment very beautiful because it's meaningful. Right. I like connecting those points. I, I always think more abstractly, so that would be the way I would think about beauty, like the resource value or what it represents meaningfully to yourself. And I like that you brought up spiritual is something that uh, brings up emotions. That's an impact of a spiritual item. That's neat. But you're, you're interpreting your emotions differently. Well, one emotion may be fearfulness or, or caution or awe. And now there's a lot of interest in awe. And that a lot of it is related to spiritual components. Uh, that's why awe inspiring sometimes uses the metaphor. But the idea that you're, uh, you're aware of its location, its meaningfulness to you, 
uh, certainly you've learned about what it is. So there's a lot of learning associated with any of these systems, even if there may be an innate uh, core to some of the properties of it. Uh, that tree is something you've learned in that location. So for example, when our animals are moving around in, in, in a habitat like some of the ground schools we study, uh, burrows are a very safe refuge, for example, from a predator if it chases them, a hawk or a coyote. Not a good place to be if it's a snake because the snakes will use burrows. So all of a sudden this one hole that's safe could be dangerous in different settings. Uh, they see a snake, now I'm not gonna go in that hole. It's dangerous. But if they see a coyote, it's a good place to go or, or a, a hawk or eagle overhead, good, good place to go. So this is how different things have, that's why it's contextual. And, and natural selection has shaped that context for assessment. These animals have had millions of years to view their burrows and, and areas to hide as, as critical in these various settings. Differently for this thing that's slow moving, different for something that's fast moving. The meaning changes over time. It's sort of like when really large people at some point were thought to be wealthy because they had a lot of food and then later on they might be thought of as not as wealthy because they weren't uh, managing with their fitness or whatever it might be. Well, they're not managing, not necessarily managing, uh, they're not thinking in advance, their, their level of expectations or they're distracted with other aspects that could uh, impact their lives. So yeah, it's, 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 it's complicated. It's not a simple topic, and it's, but it's an interesting one. I would say environmental aesthetics could involve a variety of these things I've said. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not studied that way by many researchers, but that it should include ecology very heavily into it and the, and the way we interact with the environment. Ecology is a slightly different field. One thing that comes to mind is what I would like to check with as far as scientists or individuals that have had an impact, when you think about that for some or any individuals that come to mind that they guided you in a direction towards what you were going to study or still currently now, they are like a representation of what you value. You're asking me to, to, to think about different people that, and, and, uh, that I've met and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's any specific scientists or individuals that have guided you in some form that was very impactful or you still check on their material a lot. Well, one of them is in Stony Brook in New York and that's John Shea. He studied spear throwing uh, and spears. And of course that led to my thinking about uh, the idea of uh, why Neanderthals, for example, were not uh, very good at producing any representational art. I shouldn't say representational, but realistic looking or things you can recognize. They did do a few scratches and geometric shapes. So. And uh, I thought about the whole idea of hunting as a very critical aspect uh, of, uh, of affecting the way the brain evolved. And so I'd say that we're a hunting species and we were excellent hunters, uh, whereas in some of these other species, uh, are, I mean, related humans, uh, like in uh, archaic people living in uh, Asia or Europe, probably not as effective. And so the way the animals treat them are differently because they were not killing them as effectively as we were in Africa. So there's a lot of interesting things of what we call arms races going on. And I think that he inspired uh, part of that, but he's an anthropologist. Uh, uh, there are others that uh, are, you know, I've been interested in, in, in the neurobiology part, kind of keeping track of these things, but the, I'm not as enamored by the research on doing brain scanning, uh, uh, I, even though I have done some of that. Uh, one of my first graduate students did it on campus uh, uh, very early on, studying as a pain. I think I like to look at behavior as the output rather than just saying you know, where things are active in the brain. I think it's a better index if I'm telling you or drawing something or showing you something. It's much more explicit than if you're looking at pattern areas in the brain. So that has not been as inspiring uh, as actually looking at real behavior. Mm -hmm. I think as uh, provides that. So individuals who study that, uh, uh, one of my uh, a, a colleague that I've been interacting with, Jessica Uzinski, is studying. Uh, the way our eyes are attracted to different shapes. She's worked with me on looking at uh, how lions are perceived and other antelopes and stuff. And, and I think that that's a different direction. So uh, going in that direction where it is inspirational, because uh, I can continue to collaborate with colleagues, uh, even as I'm no longer in a lab anymore, I can do it indirectly. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I came into the world at the time I did, because uh, essentially, if I had been 10 years too early or 10 years too late, it might have been a whole different perspective because 
uh, I could I could take it back to the early spirits where you have uh, people uh, like Brock, for example, one of the early Cubists uh, of Picasso. They began to do shapes, for example, they would draw the mandolin or the guitar as kind of a kidney bean-like shape, and they, they would have curving forms in their abstract work. And that led to design by the 1950s of having geometric shapes that were, well, not much geometric, but curvilinear shapes. Had I, that's the period when I began to think about form in this realm because they were biologically looking, they, they, biological patterns uh, indirectly. I mean, it just, it just because the way they, the cubist art was translated into design. Uh, and, and so we have what they call biomorphic shapes of the 1950s. And people still love these sort of different shapes that today. People buy furniture. It's very popular in the mid 19th century uh, architecture. And I came in that period. That's what inspired me to think about these biological forms. It wouldn't have happened if it had been into a geometric period in design, going back maybe into the, like in the 1980s or the 1940s, a little bit earlier. So I was very lucky to uh, have that uh, timing to allow me to think about things. And, I'm, and so I'm happy it happened that way because it's been very playful. It's been a wonderful career. It's kind of funny. It reminded me very much when you described, well, two things. One, going with where your inspiration is highly valuable, always a great idea because that's where you're energized towards. And then the way you just described that, it reminded me exactly of this one Warren Buffett video where he was like, I was wired for as asset allocation and the timing where I was born, it was like, yeah. it fit perfectly. Whereas if it was a hundred years before that, he, he felt like he would have had no purpose, maybe, I don't know. But oh, it's timing, very good timing. And, uh, and a lot of us fall into that where we're able to do things. And, and things just sort of unfold naturally. Your brain is thinking about, or your mind is thinking about, where we would go with these ideas. The problem is that I, although I had this core of interest in, let's say, evolutionary aesthetics, I kept spinning around doing other related topics uh, as I would do this. So there was, there was a core tied to it, but it wasn't necessarily, these could be independent studies. So you know, we studied, for example, the resistance to venom because I was interested in studying, well, I want to make sure these ground schools haven't been exposed to snakes for thousands of years. The only way to study that is to see if their immunity to snakes declines, and it does. Well, that's led to a whole area now that's inspired work where they're studying uh, populations that have uh, resistance to venom, and now populations of snakes have become, have, the venom is actually stronger because of that, that arms race that they have to have. So that was the byproduct of, of, of being interested in not venom resistance per se, I wanted just a cue to some way to show that snakes had not been around these populations for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, at least to somebody else's work that's developing now. And so I'm so, I'm so pleased to see that occur. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the biochemistry myself, even though we did a little bit of it, but it's exciting to see how an idea will take off and develop itself later on. So again, these things, you have no idea how they're gonna start. They, 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 they trigger. And sometimes people go back and discover earlier papers that might be 50 years ago, and then all of a sudden they'll get ideas from that if they're because this is online. Two points you brought there are wonderful. One, it made me think of the arms race that's funny between organisms, like one gets a harder shell, and then there's like, I have to get a harder shell. Then it ends up being like a super hard shell. It right. started just from a... Well, they, or maybe they do a different behavior where they keep on, they find out where they're not going to be involved with predators. So they find they're, they're using the environment differently. So, uh, no, I think it's, uh, I think predator-prey interaction for me has been one of the most exciting areas I can think about. Uh, it has implications so very broadly in terms of brain development and uh, aesthetics, uh, how we are attracted to things, maybe how we keep track of where things are in the environment, how we feel comfortable in open space versus more confined space. Uh, all of that is very relevant, and it's a, it's a fun topic to think about. If you So that experience where I had that Star Wars-like explosion of thought when I was, uh, uh, you know, 23 uh, years old, uh, really was a very powerful motivator in my life. You don't forget these key moments and a lot of emotions attached to them. I like the message where you said that your idea, it sparks other ones. You don't know if it's today. One music artist, he said, we might not be the one who does the thing, but let's not be so selfish to think that we cannot influence the person later on, maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now, whatever it might be. And that's, that's why I think uh, when I was working in aerospace, I felt uncomfortable because I, these ideas I knew were gonna end up what they call a round uh, 
uh, you might have a round drawer, or basically a wastebasket. Uh, they would not, they would, if we were working on something, it was not going to develop further. And that's a lot of effort that's gone. You know, you're sort of like sunk costs. You, there's no recovery. You've spent the effort, but there's no outcome. There's no product that comes out of it. No influence of, of someone else in the future. So that's uh, that's that's the sad part. Where in science you can come up with ideas that might later on influence somebody. Uh, at least, if nothing else, it's entertaining to your colleagues who are interested in the similar sciences. And I view a lot of uh, the work I've done as more in the entertainment business uh, because it's, it has some dramatic components, and the people that are reading it are interested in that topic. It's it's entertaining, but it's limited to an entertainment audience of those who have some knowledge about the topic. So it's it's fun. It's been it's been a real blast uh, as a career. Mm -hmm. I have this general feeling that anything we do in some category, it shows up elsewhere. But there is value to the uh, writer Seth Godin would say, always ship things because you want to at least get something out there such that it doesn't have that sunk cost feeling. Right, sort of exactly. Yeah. Well, what you're doing is actually relevant because you're informing people as well. I mean, this is a form of entertainment that's also transferring information. Uh, from different people, and they're getting ideas by listening to you, so that's very relevant. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way, and it can build on itself. Uh, it's like a networking effect. I kind of like uh, items that are networking, kind of like the Santa Fe Institute, kind of nonlinear, multidisciplinary mixed with other items. Mm -hmm. I like that concept. It's a wonderful thing. I always like to throw in at the conclusion of an episode what, if you had a, a megaphone to all people on the planet, what might be something you would tell them about predator-prey interaction, vision perception, or another message of your choosing? Well, here's the thing to think about. Uh, we're undergoing a serious condition now with the uh, Anthropocene where uh, we're in impacting the environment. And uh, the environment is changing so slowly that we're able to habituate to these changes. It's not like having an, an interaction where uh, when we were during the arms race of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, they were building up missile power. We, you know, we had the counter effects of the, building our technology back and forth. Uh, that's because the threat has a brain. We know its location and everything else. And in the case of the environment, it's diffused. It's undergoing slow changes. It doesn't have a predator-like quality to it that would make us alarm and react to it. But you know, you have a country that develops nuclear power, then it, it can be scary. Like maybe possibly Iran or or North Korea. We're very alert to those sort of issues. But it, but there may be habitat changes, and we're just treating them very uh, in a very neutral way. There's no immediate threat. I think the virus, in many ways, uh, has that sort of property. We didn't react to it like a predator. Had it been predator-like, where people were dying uh, in, or very, showing very strong effects, like they did when the first SARS virus came out, we would we would have reacted very quickly. So we have, we're, I think the important thing is we need to know that we're not really set up to respond to slow unfolding threats. We're gonna to have to use cultural education and strong incentives, uh, probably a lot of social modeling where people do things uh, that, uh, they, well, if they're doing it, I, I should do it that way because I'll be shamed if I don't do it that way, like adding solar panels or buying electric cars and so on. So there's gonna be a lot of interesting aspects that relate to this sort of uh, predator Prey interaction. It's a long, It's been a very important part of our evolutionary history. I want to say I'm very glad for this last hard-hitting point because I always think about this concept of if something's happening. I, I like those like responses that are using our force versus not our force, but our our energy, our evolutionary response versus those things that are distant and slow. And I still feel them, but I, they get absorbed into the nothingness and then. Changes. I, nobody's. I haven't spoken with anybody about that concept, but I've always uh, preferred things that are more. Maybe we can see it, like the virus, the response to it, and oh, this is actually in place. More of that. I, I like that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's 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 that's why I think the whole idea of understanding a little bit about evolutionary history and how we deal dealt with the environment under very risky situations is important to know about to think about how we behave today and how we can be educated better as well to respond. This is true. Professor Richard Huss, I would like to thank you for having joined the episode and bringing forth a lot of information on this one. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed talking to you.
same here. And we are out. 